Welcome to the Nerdist Podcast number 824. This episode brought to you by CISO.com, S-E-E-S-O, just like it sounds. It's ad-free streaming comedy with new originals, quotable classics, late night stand-up specials. If you like comedy, you probably should subscribe to CISO. Uh, for instance, Jonah Ray's Hidden America is on there. Also, our other pals Cameron Esposito and Rhea Butcher have a show called Take My Wife. Uh, it's a new show about careers and couples and comedy and motorcycle jackets. Uh, they have a stand-up podcast called Put Your Hands Together. And uh, they are fast-rising stars in the comedy community. Uh, in their own, Each of them, uh, it's, it, they're such an amazing couple because they have such different styles. But they work great as a couple. So that is a, essentially what Take My Wife is about. So go to CISO.com, use the promo code Take My Wife, get two months free. Thank you to CISO and uh, Take My Wife for sponsoring this episode of the Nerdist Podcast. It's number 824, uh, Max Brooks. My friend Max Brooks. He's so cool. Oh, Max is fucking genius. Such a nice guy. Yeah, but he's a fucking genius. He is. Like, he's not just a nice guy, he's brilliant and super normal. Um, Max's dad, Mel Brooks, was on the podcast a while back. Also, oh, uh, Mel Brooks him. also was just recently on the Leonard Malton yes, podcast, he was which was new, on movies. new to the Nerdist uh, Network. And that's a great interview to know. Oh man, check that out. Malton's awesome, but uh, Mel is great, and Max was very instrumental in getting Mel on the podcast. And we've been friends for uh, Max and I've been friends for a couple years now. And he wrote World War Z. Not he wrote the book, not the movie. We talk about that a little bit, and he has uh, a new series, a new comic series called Cinema Purgatorio, which is available from Avatar Press, uh, so pick it up. He's not just a great comic book writer and a novel writer, but he's also a great thinker, and, uh, and, a, and I was, it, this, this was a super, super engaging podcast to even just be in the room for, because yeah. Max, you can just kind of poke him a little bit, and then just amazing stuff comes out of his mouth, <laughs> and then I feel like, oh, I'm not that smart, but I'm very happy and very proud to be friends with him and present you this episode of the Nerdist Podcast, which is also brought to you by Blue Apron, Blue Apron, which I adore. I got Blue Apron for my mom. She loves it, right? She absolutely, it's her favorite thing because she likes to do, like, she doesn't like pre made stuff. She loves to cook and tinker. And she, so Blue Apron just provides the, the freshest, highest quality ingredients uh, and they deliver them to you. Uh, they've established uh, partnerships with over 150 local farms, fisheries, ranchers across the United States. Seafood is sourced sustainably under standards developed in partnership with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. Oh, really? Yes. You didn't Good know that? I didn't, Monterey but I Bay love awesome. that. Uh, it's regenerative farming practices, and they're used for the produce. Blue Apron can be delivered to 99% of the continental United States. And because they ship the exact amount each ingredient was required for the recipe, there's no food waste. So... Uh, I think Blue Apron is great, not just if you're my mom, but if you're a family <laughs> and you want to bond with your family, but you don't have time to go to the store. Uh, it's very affordable, less than $10 per meal. And it's a good way to learn how to cook, too. Good way to learn how to cook. And honestly, uh, what I'm learning the older I get is that the best way to control what you put in your body is to make it. Yep. You don't know what you're getting when you go to a restaurant or you just buy shit yep. from the grocery store that's you pre-made. Really so this allows you to eat healthy sustainable food delicious home-cooked meals uh and you're going to cook with incredible ingredients you, you know what it could be japanese ramen noodles or wild caught alaskan salmon they're bringing you the best all right so check out this week's menu get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash nerdist do it you will love how good it feels uh if you want to make healthier choices in your life this is a great way to start combine it with exercise and feel start to feel good wouldn't that be crazy <laughs> if you started to feel good uh, create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. Don't wait. BlueApron.com slash Nerdist. Thanks to Blue Apron, a better way to cook, for sponsoring this episode of the Nerdist Podcast. 824 with Mr. Max Brooks. Now entering Nerdist.com. Oh, thank you That's very much. That's issue one of Cinema Purgatorio. Fantastic. That's Alan Moore's new masterpiece. Alan Moore. Look at these names on here. I see Garth Ennis on here. I see a Max Brooks on here. This is fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. How you been? I've been good. How, good. Have, you, how have you been? I've only seen you on the television. I know. Well, you know, uh, this is going to turn into a Californian sketch. But Can't wait. 
because you're such a West Side, you're like you're so West Side, right. and we're so East Side. It, it that is a that is a difficult bridge to gap sometimes. Separate cities. Yeah, no, that's... <laughs> now, you know, everyone says this side, that side. It's a completely different part of the, co- of the state. It no, legitimately no, is. It is. I can tell you, the last time I was on this lot, I think I was working here as a PA. In the 90s. <laughs> on what? On Daddy Dearest with Richard Lewis and Don Rickles. Oh, my <laughs> God. That's fucking amazing. I remember that yeah, show. That show, I think it lasted about four episodes. And that was pretty cool because Don Rickles, I don't know if you ever met the guy? I have, yeah. Isn't he like just the sweetest, nicest? He is. You know, what's interesting is I I, I had met him at um, Craig Ferguson at a Christmas party a few years ago. And Don was sitting in a chair and... He introduced me. Oh, Craig, this is Chris. He's a comedian. And Don's like, oh. And he, and he had all these great stories about comedy, all this great advice about comedy. So I had our person reach out and be like, let's get Don Rickles on the podcast to talk about comedy. And his, his person was like, he doesn't like to talk about comedy. I'm like, I just <laughs> talked to him for like 40 minutes. On the spot. The, the best stories. Oh, his stories. His best stories are about World War II. Oh, my God. You know, he was on a PT boat in the largest naval battle in world history. I didn't know that. Would, nobody knows it. It's just, but it's that generation. Everybody did something. And I asked him, I'm like, what was that like? I mean, what were the Japanese like? And, and did malaria or whatever? And he, he was like, no. He said the worst part about that was these were small boats and where they were tied up to the quay at night. So if the guy was whacking off in the bunk above you, the whole boat shook. <laughs> <laughs> and you wanted a good night's sleep. You would always be like, hey, come on. What kind of violent whacking... Is 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 that? These oh, were little like plywood it's the last boats. Whack of your life. Depression yeah. era yeah. whacking. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. post depression. This is also yeah. you're 18. Yeah. And you can't not. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Exactly. What's the thing? Saltpeter is that the thing they uh they, they give? That was the rumor they used to put. I think in army food they um they they said that they put it in there. Like in when I was in ROTC and they put it in our MREs. They said that. Yeah. They said the saltpeter stopped you up and killed your sex drive. Yeah. Is that did they actually do that, or was it they were just I, trying to create some psychosomatic? It um, probably was. Impetus. Yeah. yeah, it was one of those things. Impetus. That's what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah, it's a great. That's or, your next great. special. <laughs> or, that's my next <laughs> yeah. special psychosomatic impotence. <laughs> yeah, actually, hmm. <laughs> put it on the board. <laughs> <laughs> what more? ID ten. Oh, okay. Yeah, psychosomatic impotence. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I remember that series. It. Yeah, that was one of those ones where you're like, well, Don Rickles, Richard Lewis, how could this not? How could this fail? How could this not go? You know, it for... came out just as the PC movement started. <laughs> Five years ago, it would have been amazing because it was a new All in the Family. Right. And it really was a great opportunity for sort of old and new. And it was literally just as America's sphincter tightened. And that was it. <laughs> Did you – now, what happened after you were a PA on that show? I went back to school. It was the summer between junior and senior year. Oh, gotcha. So it literally was like, this was fun, guys. I got to go back to school. Max, you were working on so many – the the articles that you were sending me that you were writing are fucking – they're horrifying yeah. and amazing. So I just want to kind of get a balance of – I just want to get an idea of everything you're working on. I'm sure whether or not people know uh, you wrote World War Z – uh, and the great radio play version of that is really kind of the oh, definitive yeah. for yeah. you, the definitive version of yeah. that. And I know people, it's, when they asked you about the movie, you're like, got nothing to do with it. Right. Turned in a script. They didn't use it. Not my problem. Didn't even turn in a script. Oh, yeah, I thought you turned in a script. No, 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 no. I had nothing to do with it. Yeah. So not a bad movie. He had an outline in novel form. Yeah. <laughs> not a bad <laughs> And a, and a radio uh, play uh, as an uh, audio storyboard. They turned that in. Yeah. They decided, well, that's, that's what like I turned title. in. That was my contribution. <laughs> but that's what's so interesting about this business is like, well, why even bother to buy the IP, to, to license the IP? Why not just <clears throat> call it something? If they were going to completely change it and put in like piles of fast zombies, like, why not just call it something else? I literally have no idea. And what was crazy about it was it was easier to watch. When because it was so different, right? Because I didn't, I didn't have to watch my characters be mangled. You know, like right, yeah. what must that have been like for Stephen King to watch The Shining? And it's almost The Shining, but it's not, right? You know, or if Tolkien had been watching The Hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> I literally took my kid to see The Hobbit after we like read the book together. It was a reading exercise for him, father son, and he's turning to me and he's like, 
Dad, I don't remember this part. And I'm like, neither do I, son. <laughs> <laughs> no one does, boy. No, no one, one does. does. <laughs> but at least with the World War Z movie, it's like once you get past the title, it's like, hey, it's 28 Days Later on crack. It's awesome. It's yeah. fun. Right. There he's saving the world. Yeah. yeah. But then – because – Jonah and I would <laughs> we would talk about Twenty Eight Days Later, and someone would say it's a zombie movie, and Jonah would go, uh, "It's a rage virus movie. It's not a zombie movie. Yeah, We're not yeah. zombies. It's a rage virus." I know. Oh, yeah. please! I, I had my my sphincter tightening moment when I realized when the, when the military guy says, "I'm waiting to see how long it takes for the infected to starve to death." I'm like, "Oh, so they they ingest food and water? <laughs> well, three days without water, the human body shuts down. So literally, the guy would have woken up in the hospital, and everybody would have just been dead." <laughs> And the movie would have been called Four Days Later, and that would have been it. What I would have yeah, loved well, to have seen, we should have done this just even just for fun, is uh, we should have gone to see it at the Arclight with you. And then as the movie started, just like snuck the microphone away from the, <laughs> from the page, you know, yeah. and, and just have you go, wait, 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 you yeah. know, like at different times of the movie. Yeah, it's like, like an angry MST. <laughs> like, wait a minute. So they don't need water, yet they're sprinting? Yeah. <laughs> That's it. You're done. I yes. do think. Oh, boy. I do think, and I've said this before, uh, a freshly... Uh, uh, Shaved? A freshly yep. sh- shorn. Uh, like a, I think like it's like Real if you're sexy. infected and you die and you wake up, you still have all the same muscle mass. Yeah, uh, and then you can't, and it, like in the desire to go as fast as you know they can to the next thing, but they'll the muscles will tear and they'll eventually shuffle around. Well, there was an awesome. Do you remember Cronenberg's movie The Brood? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. See, like that one, they thought it out because basically these mutant kids are born with like a gas tank. They're born with like the sack on their back of food resources, mm-hmm. and once they burn it out, they're gone. That's it. So they have their lifespan, and I thought like that. Okay, you've worked out the logic of it. That makes sense. Yeah. So uh, what? How? When did you? Were you always fascinated with horror as the as a genre, or was it just you kind of had this take on? No, I think with zombies, it, w- it was the only movie that could get through my ego defense. <laughs> because it just just by nature, I mean, and I don't think anybody really writing horror films really understands this, but the world we live in is a world dominated by humans. We are the dominant species on the planet. And so in order to kill us, they've got to pick us off. You know, they've right. got to get a few, like, hot teens and a token black guy away from the herd. Right. And those teens then have to make bad choices. Right. Because it's really hard to kill human beings. <laughs> so they've got to do something in order to get there. You know, the naked girl in Amity says, let's take a swim. Right. So every horror film I watched, I thought, well, I would not make these bad choices. You know, I was the American in the international politics arena. I was the isolationist. <laughs> I was like, if I just stay home, mind my own business, no giant shark, no Jason, whatever. <laughs> and yet here come zombies and it's like, oh, it doesn't matter what choices you make. They're coming after you and, th- and there is no safe place. I mean, I think for me, the sort of gut drop moment in Dawn of the Dead, when they get in the helicopter and they take off and then the next day they wake up and they look down and Reiniger says, Jesus, it's everywhere. And to watch that was like, oh my God, there's no, there's no mental way I can slither out of this. This is it. And then I had my nemesis enemy. Yeah. And then was, and that was, I was hearing you say that and then kind of the same with the extinction parade too, which is the kind was a very similar idea, but from right from the side of. Did you read Extinction Parade? No, I did not. It's basically uh, it's basically there's vampires and they're and they they kind of you know they kind of live like partiers and then it they start to realize <laughs> like oh there's some sort of thing and the humans are going away our food source is going away and some of them don't really take it seriously and it's just kind of it's the dealing with that from another kind of supernatural oh, yeah. being's point of view well, that's what daybreakers did that pretty well too they did well you know what, what was interesting daybreakers was really was really fascinating to me watching it before i wrote extinction parade because daybreakers deals with a vampire world that still thinks like humans yeah. They're still inventors, innovators, organizers. It's still a human world, yeah. except they are vampirized. Whereas in my world, the vampires have been at the top of the food chain since the dawn of time. So they have no coping mechanisms, yeah. no problem-solving skills, because <laughs> they've never had problems. Yeah, yeah. And what, what sort of was the inspiration for that was two things. One was La Brea Tar Pits. You look at the saber-toothed cat, and you think that was a highly specialized predator, and then the world changed, and it couldn't change with it. And then also being a parent where I look at my little boy and I'm just like, dude, you need to learn how to deal with problems because eventually you'll go into a world of them. And I thought, what if there was a whole species that had never been taught that? Just living the way they live. They had little human Renfields to solve their problems and suddenly, oh my God, 
we're on our own and can we grow up and adapt fast enough? Because also I like to say they were spoiled by Mother Nature and Father Time. Because <laughs> also like when you're immortal, you don't feel that ticking clock like, oh, I got to get my shit together and I got to get things done. Right. And suddenly they hear this thing called the ticking clock. And they, have, they don't just have to adapt. They got to adapt fast. Right. And, which they have no concept of time. So that's Extinction Parade is, is sort of a parable for us. Oh, that's amazing. So, what's every, so what is everything that you're working on right now? What, All is, right. what is the slate of Max Brooks' projects? Well, like? we'll start off with definitely with pop culture Yes. Uh, Alan Moore, mm-hmm. which I don't know if you've heard of him. I, uh, <laughs> is he a football yeah. coach? Yeah, he's, he's like Mike Ditka, but with <laughs> a lot of hair. So Alan Moore wanted to put together an anthology of horror stories. And he got together the awesomeness of the awesomeness. Uh, it, Garth Ennis, Kieran Gillen, Christos Gage. So he got together this awesome team and then me. Because <laughs> I had a story I wanted to tell, but it wasn't what I consider to be traditionally horror. When I think horror, I think like dark alleys and and, ah, and uh, suspense, and mine's not. Uh, so mine is actually – a throwback to the old 1950s movie Them, mm-hmm. nice. which is one of my favorite movies of all time. And the one thing Them never did was have a giant ant battle because they couldn't mm-hmm. afford it. They, right. had, they yeah. could only afford like three animatronic ants and that was it. And so I actually went back to the studio and I, I said – I pitched them Them. I said, now we can finally do the act three they've never done. And they loved it and I, I went up through the chain of command and finally I got the note, does your giant ant movie have to be giant ants? <laughs> hey, valid question. Valid question. Yeah. People like wasps. Yeah. yeah. And they said, do they even have to be giant? I said, all right. I said, we, we, we are done. Because it occurred to me, I actually – I only need you guys as, as a title, them. I don't need you to do a giant bug movie. They've been done. And, right. And I thought, and as long as I'm breaking, why does it have to be the 1950s when we had the technology to wipe them out? What if there was a giant – bug war at a time when our technology was just at its infancy. Not so infant that we'd get slaughtered, but not so advanced that we would do the slaughtering. Like Bronze Age? 1863. Okay. Battle of Gettysburg. (laughs) Robert E. Lee, commander of the American army. There is no civil war because it never happened because the outbreak happened right before the South seceded. And at that point, the greatest military mind in America was Robert E. Lee. So he is commanding what's left of the Army of the Potomac, facing this horde that's coming from the south. And it's not going to be a victory. All he's hoping for is a stalemate. Because if he can halt this colony long enough, then all our technology that's coming up, uh, all the idea of repeating rifles, chemical weapons, human flight, electricity, all these things are just starting, but they need time can leave by us enough time because if they break through and go north we're we're done north america is done so that is the battle of gettysburg and that was my story so i wrote it up and i and i gave it to alan moore and i said i know this is nothing like you normally do and he read it and he said that's exactly why i want it wow. so god bless alan moore and he said yeah you're in so and, and and what was cool about him was my story unfolds very 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 slowly Because there's also a social undertone in it. It's about not having the luxury of prejudice. Because the story starts out, issue one, you think it's Gettysburg. And then you realize, oh, some of these soldiers are from the south. And then issue two, commanding General Lee, what's going on? And then by later issues, we're like, wait a minute. There's black soldiers fighting alongside white soldiers. There's women fighting alongside men. Uh, Basically, we don't have the luxury of dicing our species up into little categories and picking our favorites. Right. We're we're all in. It's either all of human talent or none of us survive, and that's that is uh, a more perfect union. So, what is what is this project then, and when when is it going to? Well, what happened was Alan Moore put all our stories together uh, into Cinema Purgatorio, Mm -hmm. and the first three issues have just come out. You can order it on uh, Avatar. I think it's avatarcomics.com or avatar.com. It's by Avatar Comics. Just Google it. Google Avatar Comics. They're already out in the stores as well. Mm -hmm. But I always like to order my stuff online because I'm married and I can't leave the house. (laughs) Or the West Side. Yeah. (laughs) And we have no comic shops. There's no comic shop on the West Side. We've got Heidi Ho and that's it. (laughs) You know know how bougie it is on the West Side, right? (laughs) 
<laughs> I can't I can't see through the forest of man buns. <laughs> So I can't even get to Heidi Ho anymore. Yeah. Best candle shops in town, though. Yeah. Yeah. That. Let me really tell you. Really good for bath salts. Oh, if, yeah. you, or... if you need mustache wax, if you want to look like John Wilkes Booth, that's <laughs> the place to go. So, yeah, if you go to uh, the Avatar comic site, there it is, Cinema Purgatorio, and we're going to have new issues coming out every month. Because they're all written. They're just being drawn now. You know, it, just seeing this and Extinction Parade and World War Z and then the real world stuff that you're writing, mm. uh, it seems like you're fascinated by the idea of, of, of mankind being basically realizing it's a part of a fast-moving machine <clears throat> that it can't steer. You really seem to enjoy this idea of all of a sudden... Uh, oh shit, we're fucked, you know. And how do we deal? How do yeah. we process that? Well, you know, the thing is, which is weird, is I think most people enjoy horror because they feel inherently safe, and I don't, and I never did. You know, I grew up in L.A. in the '80s, which was like ground zero for crack, gangs, AIDS, fires, floods, earthquakes, Rodney King riots. So I, and plus, being the child of celebrities, there was always the kidnapping thing. Right. And, I mean, I remember my parents, I would go to bed and I'd hear them talking at the table about their friend Penny Marshall being held in her house. Somebody broke in and and then I heard about, oh my God, Dom DeLuise's kids being grabbed at the pool in uh, Vegas. So, so they were just trying to figure out how much they could get for you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Definitely. Because there was only one of me. <laughs> They're like, well, an arm, a leg. <laughs> so it was, it was a paranoid time and I sort of never had that child invincibility thing. It was also that period of time when, when the crime rates in America were getting to a crazy point where they were right. like, oh, in 20 years, this is there's gonna, yes. this is going to be like Escape from New York. And that, that was the thing, was all these sci-fi movies were coming out like, yeah, if we keep going on the path we're going, it will be Escape from New York. And then you threw in Nuclear War. Mm -hmm. Then you throw in The Day After. Yeah. And of course, like me, I wasn't satisfied with Day After. I had to watch Threads, mm -hmm. which is the British version, which takes it like four generations in. So, yeah, I mean, for me, I've always been trying to make the world a safer place because I realize how safe it isn't. Yeah. But it's amazing to me. I mean, I'm sure that people know uh, who your parents are. Uh, your Mel has been on the podcast. But, yeah. And, and we have you to thank for that because I think you were the, the deciding vote that said, hey, you should do this. And I then see. he did it. So, uh, Dad, you got to do it. He's he's a good guy. Uh you know, his mom is as scared for his safety as my mom was for mine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the uh, the Catholics and the Jews are very. There's just really one degree of separation yeah. there, uh, and it starts with a J. But uh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yeah, I was right. gonna, I was gonna say jerking off, but. Um, <laughs> Oh, everyone, Wait, they are you saying that. we all do that? Yeah, they all do that. But we all feel like shit about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we all just we all can think of. We're always trying to out innovate each other about how to this economy of guilt, like the guilt politics. Yeah, we're just trying is, not to rock the boat. Is unbelievable. But uh, you know, growing up in the eighties, uh, child of hugely famous uh, parents, how, how did you not grow up to be an asshole? <clears throat> My mom. No, because my mom was a she was a silent uh, a closet thinker. You know, nobody cared what she had to say. Nobody cared if she had a thought in her head. They wanted this proto milf, Mrs. Robinson. But like, my mom was a closet scientist. Her favorite book was The Microbe Hunters. Oh wow! The invention of the microscope, the discovery of germs. So like, my mom and I would watch these documentaries about uh, Semmelweis. The guy who discovered maybe we should wash our hands before we deliver babies. Mm -hmm. That guy. Oh, good idea. Yeah. So my mom would always be reading to me these stories. And she would read to me stories about primitive human beings and how they survive. She loves survival stories. So that's that was the, the quiet, silent world I grew up in. And that's probably what you know made me not a dick. Yeah. Also because I'm not the child of baby boomers. I'm oh, yeah. <laughs> interesting. My parents are a generation older. So I'm the child of World War II parents. So like my parents never did drugs. They never partied. I mean ironically for a Hollywood family, they – I grew up as a child of a non-broken home. Right. All my friends' parents got divorced except for mine. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was home every night, you know, and, and that was it. So yeah, I, I think I had ironically a stable life that was not afforded a lot of kids around me. But your dad, but your dad goes to Carl Reiner's house every night. Well, now he does. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Now, now that my mom is gone, now my dad basically has a routine where he comes home from work, after work, comes to our house, watches TV with my son, falls asleep on the couch, 
pretends that he didn't fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> such a denial about that. <laughs> sort of sort of falls asleep and then and then every now and then goes oh yeah uh, yeah there's Yoda. Uh, uh, you know hey, they stole that from me. And then <laughs> then he goes to Carl's and they yell at each other till 3 in the morning. <laughs> and they watch TV about and what? well you know they're an old married couple they <laughs> And then my dad drives home at 90 miles an hour and gets super mad if the cop doesn't recognize him. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Some young cop didn't know who I was, didn't know my work. (sighs) I got to go to traffic school. (laughs) So that's, that's his life. That, well, isn't, but is he working on another Spaceballs? That's what I hear. I mean, I know they're talking about it, but yeah. I mean, you and I well know that I Am Legend with Will Smith started in 1986 with Arnold Schwarzenegger. So movies can have a long development process. Right. Now, and knowing my father's health, it may be another 20 years. Because it'll be another <laughs> – he will be around another 20 years. Well, what's, what's really interesting is, is you know, it almost it, – it, it feels like <clears throat> that sort of secret to – obviously some genetics I'm sure play into it, but that – that kind of fountain of youth is uh, is purpose and yeah. and, oh, yeah. and and engagement and you know even because I would always say <clears throat> I would always look at people like uh, like Joan Rivers you know who died from a, a freak accident right. not from old age you know but she was still super sharp even at almost at eighty oh yeah because she was so engaged in work and had purpose and your dad too it's still you know it still seems like there's a million things he still is, is working on and wants to do well i think the secret to to that kind of longevity is you you have to be you have to be completely fanatically hungry for it, but at the same time not hamstrung by self-destructive distractions. Right. So he sort of hit the sweet spot in there, and that because a lot of these guys are you know hungry and and crazy, and they and they they're not happy unless the god-sized hole is being filled, but they get into drugs or women or hurting themselves. You know, I mean, Jimi Hendrix was that way. The problem is. Had he just been sober, he'd probably still be alive today. Right. A lot of those guys. So my dad never had that. He never had the drugs or the alcohol or, you know, he loved my mom and he was very faithful. But that was also – faith for him was also paranoia because he said he never wanted to get that call. All the other writers when he grew up always had mistresses Mm -hmm. and they all got that call from the mistress. We have to talk. I think I'm pregnant. Right. And because you know, they all thought it was for free. They thought it was free love. And it's never for free. There's <laughs> right. always a bill to be paid. Right, right, right. And he never wanted to pay that bill. <laughs> so he just thought, this is not worth it. Right. This is not worth it to see. You know, do you remember Crimes and Misdemeanors? Of course, yeah. yeah. Fantastic Well, that's movie. based on all those crazy women who would call up and say, I'm, I'm down the street. I'm going to tell your wife. I'm calling from a payphone. Oh, my God. So, yeah, because all those guys from that generation, you know, they were all schlubby guys from the Bronx or Brooklyn, and suddenly they're famous. And showgirls are throwing themselves at them, and they thought, hey, what could be the harm? Right. Well, we now know. That's the harm. That's the harm. That's a side effect. They had to learn it. But even hearing the stories about, um, you know, Sid Caesar, like, shaking in a bathtub on weekends and being super fucked up from the – I mean, it – it feels like there are lessons to be learned in there some somewhere about how to lead a creatively fulfilling life without fucking killing you. Even though Sid lived well into no, his no, 90s. I, Sid was actually, I think, uh, a cautionary tale. And I, and I think an example of how you can save your life in that situation because he really was ground up, you know, burned out by this show. And I think the only way to do it is you have to punch out dramatically like Dave Chappelle. Everyone said Dave Chappelle went crazy when he left the show. I think he went sane. I think he saw the, the, the grinding wheels coming for him. And mm-hmm. he thought, if I stay on this, I will be used up and dead in a couple years. And he saved his own life. Yeah. And, and the only way to do it is dramatically. You, you just got to really just burn down everything and say, I'm saving my own life. I'm out. It's kind of funny how people – so much importance is placed on, on money – you know, as being the thing that solves everyone's problems. Oh, yeah. and, I, and of course, I understand that a lot of people need, I mean, like, you need money to survive, and a lot of, and right. most people have less than they need to survive, and that's a real problem. But in terms of when you get into those numbers, you know, no one ever thought, hey, I wonder if Dave's okay. It was like, he turned down $50 million. Right. You know, and then, I, you know, because I saw him, um, I was at the punchline doing shows, and he. I ended up opening for him for a handful of shows because he just he wanted oh, to headline. Yeah, so yeah. I was like, "Fine, I'll," you know. 
And then uh, he talked about it, and he was like, he goes, you know how I could walk away from $50 million? Because I had $10 million in the bank. Right. You know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, there, he goes, you know what the difference is between me and the guy who has $50 million? I was like, nothing. We even fucked some of the same girls. You yeah. know? I was like, <laughs> we did the same restaurants. You know? So just the idea that, you know, there's so much importance is placed on this idea of as much materialism as possible. And you must be fucking crazy if you could. Oh, yeah. Because that would solve all of your... When like, people say that to me, they're like, dude, you know, you can make so much money. I'm like, yeah. And then I could be, what, Pablo Escobar? He made money. Right. Uh, Who can You know, as long as your needs are met, as long as you don't have to hustle money, and you also think to yourself, will I be able to live at the same standard when I'm 70? Right. Yeah. If you can do that, if you can make enough money that you'll be okay. Yeah. When you're older and not able to make money. That's what my mother always taught me. She said, you know, make enough money that you'll be able to live and not have to hustle later right. on. Then you're okay. You know, like I thought Bill Maher said it brilliantly. He was just like, he's like, I'm at a point now where I don't know where my money goes. Like it comes in and it's invested somewhere. But like he's not doing it for the money. Most of these guys aren't at this point. Well, you'd have to – no. I, and I, I think it – because what are you going to do if you quit? Just sit in your fucking house? And right. I mean it's like then you – you know, my, my – grandfather retired he was a house painter he retired at you know when he was able to retire at like 50 or 55 and then then he was just in his pajamas at four right. every day and I, I don't know maybe he was happy with that mm-hmm. life but Tell i certainly about that again, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> i don't think it's a yeah. it doesn't sound like an exciting way to live like maybe for a couple weeks but then you need but like i think humans we need purpose like we need we need to solve problems we need to contribute we need to be a part of something like it's Sit, sitting at home alone and not really doing anything no. for anyone is is I think can be fine as a vacation, but as a life choice, I think it can be kind of unhealthy. Well, yeah. it's, it's it's actually very important from a from a national security point of view. Is you see why you have so many problems in Europe uh, with young Muslims, and it's not their their Islam, you know, it's not their Muslimist part of them. It's the fact that these are immigrants from countries who are then shoved into these these welfare ghettos, and all their physical needs are taken care of, but they have nothing to do. And so they sit in the suburbs of Paris or Brussels uh, and with just boredom. And boy, if if you want a recipe for disaster, get any group of young men together and give them nothing to do. Right. And it doesn't matter what country, what religion, you're going to have trouble on your Well, this dovetails nicely into the pieces that you've been writing that every once in a while you'll text me and go – Hey, you don't want to sleep? Read this. Oh, you're right. <laughs> so what? Is, so talk a little bit about it. All right. Well, yeah, I text them to you because you and I both are interested in technology and paranoia. Yes. And <laughs> a little while ago, um, ever since World War Z came out, I've been tapped to speak at places like the Naval War College. And every time I speak, someone listens to me and then invites me to go speak somewhere else. And so what this all comes down to is I have just been offered a fellowship at something called the Modern War Institute. And it's essentially a think tank – on the grounds of the West Point campus. All right. And <clears throat> what it is, is it is part of a much broader trend in the military. The Army is finally starting to have the nervous breakdown that it should have had right after Vietnam. You know, when that last helicopter took off from Saigon, the Army should have had a big, long look in the mirror and said, oh, the world is changing. Warfare is changing. We're way out of our comfort zone, and we need to learn to live in this new zone. And they didn't. They did what most people do psychologically is they run back to their comfort zone, mm-hmm. which was tanks in West Germany. They went, ah, no, Vietnam was a one-off. The wars of tomorrow will be the wars of today. Let's just do what we love to do. And, and they did that. And the result was Desert Storm. Yay, good at that. Problem is what the Army's realizing now is Vietnam was not the exception of the rule. It is the rule. Uh, as proven by Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, everywhere. The the wars of tomorrow are going to be these really messy non-wars. And the army is finally starting to think about it. Well, especially now when <laughs> there's a war without any kind of real centralized government. Right. Uh, I mean, there is a body, uh, but it, it's it's amorphous and it's – more about of an idea than right. it is about a government that you can go in and and bomb their building and yeah. then they're gone and, and then, then they surrender. Like, yeah, yeah. And and that's the issue. I mean, Senator Obama said that way back in the day when he said there's no emperor that we can take the surrender from. And also, the military is starting to understand that wars of tomorrow aren't even wars in the sense of their military conflicts. Military doves tail with humanitarian, political, economic. You know, when we get involved into a country, we can't just be pulling triggers. Mm-hmm. There's a lot we have to be doing to stabilize a country. 
And so you sort of see these different schools of thought blossoming all over the military and it's really interesting. And, and hopefully we're going to bear fruit from that soon because the last time I spoke at West Point, it gets really humbling because, you know, you and I, we talk on college campuses. You know, we talk to college kids and most college kids are like, yeah, come on, monkey dance. Yeah. I'm a special snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dancing. I'm sorry. I was just on my phone. You know, like yeah. they're not even really paying attention after they ask you to dance. Right. Which uh, is very rude. They're, they're, I am dancing yeah. up here. And they're like, come on. come on. Don't you know how awesome I am? <laughs> because my mother told me I was. And because all the algorithms on all the sites I go to bring stuff specifically to yeah. meet my needs at any given moment. My cloud score is off the charts. It's yeah. so good. It's like 82. So come on, dude. So then you talk I'm at West Point. I'm ashamed that I know what cloud I know. I'm oh. sorry. I apologize. Anyway, let's just But it. you go to West Point. You talk to these kids. And they're all leaning forward. And they're all listening. And they're all taking notes. And they're all clearly thinking about every word you're saying. And then it, it, you realize, oh, my God, like some of these kids are not going to live to be my age. And they know that. They know that going in. They know that they are signing up for a career path in which some of them will not live. Some of them will lose legs and arms or some of them will have their brains so scrambled that they'll barely be able to function by the time they're 30. And that's very obvious to them. Uh, and a lot of them also are starting to understand that the problem with the volunteer army is it allows us – to not care. I, I, I gave a speech at West Point a while ago about the dangers of a, a warrior class, and I got the idea from J. Michael Straczynski's Babylon oh. 5. <laughs> I, I said, we have a warrior class in this country, and we're in danger of creating a warrior caste because you're all going to intermarry and have kids. And one cadet said, well, what's the problem with that? I said, well, the problem is we in this country assume since you're volunteers that we don't have to feel guilty anymore. So we can send you off to war and not feel bad. Right. And I told him the true story about when I was writing G.I. Joe, the comic. Somebody who were, and I can't say the name, but somebody who was working on G.I. Joe, uh, we were talking about this, and I brought up the fact that more soldiers are dying from suicide than from combat deaths. And he said, yeah, but they're all volunteers. Nobody put a gun to their head. They're not draftees. They made a choice, so fuck them. Oh, my God. And I, and I told it in those words to these kids, and I said, look – the most of the country doesn't feel that strongly about it, but psychologically deep down, most people do feel like you made a choice and therefore you must accept the consequences and I don't. So I'm going to put a bullshit bumper sticker that says I support our troops on my car and a yellow ribbon and I'm going to go about my life. And that's sort of one of the issues why I came on board the Modern War Institute. I mean, is there anything to... The person that said that was Cobra Commander, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, Pretty shitty thing to say. No, I mean, come on, Max. They, it was <laughs> actually problem block. <laughs> oh, and, yeah. he, and he tried to rhyme it. Oh, roadblock. He said, like, fuck those guys in their eyes. I was like, roadblock, that's oh. just racist. Max, you need to take this hippy dippy bullshit someplace else. <laughs> Strange enough, it was Destro. It was Destro who was like, as long as I keep selling them money and selling them weapons, I don't care what they do. <laughs> oh, the silly voices make it okay. I worked for Halliburton. No, so it, so this is, obviously, this is a, trim, this is a, this is a serious <laughs> systemic yeah. problem. So how, you know, how, how can people sort of change their point of view or, be, the draft. Or, or, become, or become more aware well, of, of what it means to it's fight already the starting. I think soldier. the military is starting to – they didn't realize they're doing it, but they're taking steps in the right direction. Like getting, asked, getting rid of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was awesome because mm -hmm. what it allowed was ROTC back on campus. Right. And so it allowed college kids to mix with other college kids who were different from them. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't mean they should all join up, but it meant like, oh, you might have a roommate with somebody who's chosen a completely different life path. Right. And maybe you might learn something. So that's something. Uh, allowing women to serve in combat. That's a big deal because now they're talking about women registering for the draft. And that's a really nice debate we're all having. Because women are going crazy, going, oh, that's, I'm not going to let my daughter. And then other mothers are like, yeah, but it's okay if my son has to register. Mm -hmm. So it, once again, we're having a national conversation about citizenry, fairness, doing our part. So that's important. How did the, guy, how did the kid respond when you explained that to him? When I, oh, you mean about uh, the warrior cast? Yes. He apparently was so moved, he came back to my next lecture. He, and he said, like, I never forgot what you said, and I've been thinking about it a lot. And the next lecture I gave was on creativity. 
So he said, like, you've definitely given me a lot to, th- to think about, and that's all I ever want. You know, the, the best compliment I ever get is when people come up to me and say, you've given me a lot to think about. Mm-hmm. And they may disagree. And I like when they disagree and push back because then it forces me to rethink what I'm doing. That's the, – the, the, the power to have uh, respectful discourse is so – necessary and it's an art form that is almost being completely lost because yeah. of the internet because people are interfacing with text and machines and so there's a humanity there's a human factor that's lost and you don't have to be accountable for what you say so you can just the second someone doesn't right. says something that you don't like you'd be like fuck you you're worse than Hitler right. I'm gonna fucking you fuck your family and I hope they get set up it's like well now we're not having a conversation that's just an ego thing for you to feel empowered in some way to right. bully someone you we're not talking about things and how do we how do we have conversations about things, well, even if you don't yeah. agree? And I think that's the, the fundamental problem that no one ever talks about is you cannot have politeness and freedom of speech. And that's the problem with political correctness is political correctness. And, and I saw this in the 90s when I was in college. And, and I said, wait a minute, if you guys become the word police, you're going to just inspire conservatives. And sure enough, like a few years later, we got Limbaugh and Fox News and all that stuff because – We've all chosen to live in a society where we speak our minds, and that means people's feelings are going to get hurt. And if you want to live in a society free of that, then the freest society in the world is North Korea because nobody's insulting anybody over there. (laughs) Nobody's saying, I just can't believe they said that. (laughs) (laughs) Cut to Korea and some guy in North Korea is like, I can't believe they said that. (laughs) I would would even argue – I think it's eaten by dogs. Oh, yeah. And from one point of view, I would argue North Korea is the freest society on the planet because a democracy comes with a lot of extra homework. When you have a democracy, that means we are all the bosses. We're in charge. We don't get to blame the government. Like when Reagan said, you know, government's not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. Well, we're a government by, of, and for the people. So if government's a problem, we the problem. Right. (laughs) So we don't have that luxury. So therefore, I love we, that draft. We the problem. We the problem. <laughs> so we we actually have all this extra homework. We have to study issues. We have to vote. We have to contribute. North Koreans can just be like, ah, the dear leader is solving every problem, and if he doesn't, I don't have to say anything about it because I'll be killed. Right. They don't have issues there. They have stability, and so does Russia. So does China. So I just came from a Middle Eastern country. I'm not going to say where, but it's supposedly one of the good ones uh, where the sheikh is very enlightened. Mm -hmm. He's very enlightened. Everyone talks about the enlightened sheikh. He is so enlightened that when Orlando happened and I went on my phone to look at news, the news was censored by the Department of Enlightenment. Shit. And and that's something I – I mean, you know, I hate to go off on a democracy tangent, but that's kind of the issue I have with any sort of enlightened leader. Right. Is, you know, yeah, maybe he's cool now. What if he has a stroke and he comes out of his coma and he says, female circumcision, yay, and there's no checks and There's balances. nothing in place. There's to... nothing to stop him. Right. You know, if, you, if you're going to have Caesar Augustus, you got to be ready for Caligula. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it that you think? I was on the poster. Yep. <laughs> that, that's, that's the new poster for Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the log line for We the Problem. Right. right? We the Problem. But what is the – so what, what is it that people can do to – I mean it feels like at the most basic level it's about attention. And I think part of the problem is that there's so much pulling our attentions and so many things yes. that sort of feed into our natural – drive towards instant gratification and narcissism that we, you know, and not, I mean, I do blame people sometimes for getting into heated debates about things when you know they haven't really read, they don't really know what they're talking about. They've just, and this is what I told you yesterday about the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is such a fascinating, Mm -hmm. do you know about the Dunning-Kruger studies? No, tell me. Dunning-Kruger studies basically were the studies that were done where the, these researchers found that people who actually who people who know less will actually fight harder claiming that they know more oh, that's interesting and people who know more conversely will actually the more someone knows the less they will claim to know wow. so that's why you know you, uh, you go on to that's kind of the thing that Jonah used to say about we could watch history channel like the thing you gotta understand about Caesar yeah you know yeah, it's yeah. like the person who acts like they and, and of course you know any subreddit is loaded with those guys who are like well the thing you gotta understand oh, God, yeah and then you kind of start to go I, I don't know if you really know exactly what you're talking about 
uh, and it, and that's a thing. That is a function. That oh. is a function of humanity. A thing where the less people know, the more they will be assertive and in your face and jam a finger in your chest about what about their oh, sure yeah. about this. They're trying to take away our guns. Yeah. So it it I think some of that is that, but then some of it is there's just too much information to process. Well, see, and this is why I I, I mean, there's a lot of people you can blame in society, but as someone in the entertainment business, I blame us in some way because there was a time as we Max, remember go. yeah no. <laughs> we're not at fault here. well chris and i are old enough you guys are all youngins but we're old enough to remember a time 29 when, i yeah. don't appreciate that at yeah. all <laughs> whoa you guys are 29 that's so old <laughs> I'm, I'm 28 and a half <laughs> kermit yeah <laughs> we remember when science fiction used to infuse itself with social commentary twilight zone oh, twilight zone star, star, star trek, trek star next gen new Battlestar galactica yep. oh my god every episode was hey, about Ron Moore knew what he was fucking something doing. Well, that was the point. Science fiction used to be an amazing tool to to wake up people and to get them thinking. And it wasn't like Oliver Stone hitting you over the head with something. It was like, oh, I could enjoy Battlestar Galactica if I want, but I could also walk away from it and think, oh, wow, that's really interesting. And talking about race and politics and war. Yeah, go watch the Drumhead episode of The Next Generation. It's so good. Oh, my God. Remember, I mean, every, there's not one episode of Next Generation that didn't have a huge debate afterwards yeah. among your friends. Yeah. I mean, remember when they had the uh, the trial with Gene Simmons, uh, crewman Tarsus? Yeah. And he's a Romulan. He's part Romulan. Yeah. It becomes a witch hunt. Yeah. I mean, what a prescient episode for the world we're living in now. And that's the way it used to be. But now uh, it's becoming just about itself. It's becoming about b- just bland entertainment for entertainment's sake. Bling, just, bling, lasers. Yeah. And you see smart people trying to find <laughs> sort of the deeper message. And you're like, no. No, it's pretty much what you just saw. <laughs> and that's it. I hope it. Brian Fuller nails it with the new Star Trek episodes. I hope so. Yeah, I think because they got a good crew over there. They and all of it. The, and it, does, it could be just a small chance to put it in there. Look, I don't think anybody in this room is a fan of episodes one, two, and three of Star Wars. But <laughs> there was an amazing line where she says, this is how democracy dies, to thunderous applause. Mm-hmm. Well, if you look back on Germany in the 20s or Rome with Caesar, yeah, democracy sometimes dies to thunderous applause. Mm-hmm. And I look at some of the heroes now in some of these shows who think that they're cool. I don't want to say who they are, but like freedom fighters or survivalists or whatever. And what I see is the prototype African warlord. Mm-hmm. I see someone who, if this story keeps going, is going to end up with child soldiers. Yeah, But they don't talk about that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. So I think – if you're a sci-fi creator, if you're just a creator, it doesn't take that much to just put an extra little shellacking of social commentary or just smartness on it. And so uh, just in terms of – because there's obviously not a switch that we can flip and then, you know, oh, this is how we solve the thing. I yeah. mean it is – it really is down to an individual's responsibility as a citizen of the world. Like really research the things that you – care about yeah care about things that are important for humanity (laughs) well and also like if you're a creator i mean for example like if if you were a historian and you want to go back to pearl harbor and you have nothing but pop culture to go on so you watch movies you listen to the songs you'll know there's something called pearl harbor same thing with vietnam Mm. but the year after 9 11 there was nothing spider-man dealt with it remember that episode of spider-man that show spider-man where he's looking at the destruction and he goes i could have done something but friends the number one show in America that took place in New York didn't deal with 9-11. Was that still on in 2001? Yeah, yes. Sure oh, yeah. Went to 2004. Did not deal with it. Frasier did not deal yeah, with 9 Did it? Frasier kind of oh, did. Oh, did they? What did they have? The, because there was a huge argument because the, oh, now his, you've stepped in it. Oh, no. his, uh, his neighbor upstairs, Cam Winston, uh, who he was always feuding with yeah. uh, in an effort to get on Frasier's nerves, unfurled a giant American flag that covered his view of Seattle. <laughs> so then he had to like go to the housing, the condo board to like try to argue against the American flag being out there. After okay. 9/11. Well, there we go. So, so there Frazier was, there was one it. episode of Frasier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, just, so I just want to give problem solved. Like, so oh. there we go. I mean, you know, I mean, a creator of Frasier yeah. died on the yeah. second Oh, oh right. Yeah, so it took that. That's yeah. right. David so David. it would have had to have taken yeah. someone on Friends being on that plane. Yes. For them to Par- address it. Well, if you look at all the top 40 songs, right, at, like the year after 9-11, they literally have titles like, No Shirt, No Shoes, No Problem, I'm Feeling Pretty Good, Let's Keep On Dancing, mm-hmm. It Feels So Empty Without Me. You'd never know. 
You'd never yeah. know Iraq, Afghanistan. Well, that first issue of The Onion back after 9 11, right. Amer- America longs to care about stupid shit right. again, or something. It was something along it's, those it's, lines. It showed a picture of Britney Spears with the snake on her. Right. Well, I mean, and that was interesting. That's a coping mechanism, though. That's just a human coping mechanism. Well, but the problem is we overcompensated. Yeah. You know, we coped pretty well in World War II. We coped in Vietnam. We coped, I mean, even in Korea, we understood. And there was this weird gap, this divide between the citizenry and the people tasked with protecting them, uh, where the people tasked with protecting them said, you you just, you go, you, you're fine, we got this, don't get involved. And I do think part of it was, a knee-jerk reaction from the 60s and 70s where they thought people got too involved mm-hmm. and we tore each other apart. So mm-hmm. I think there was this notion of like, just go back to sleep and don't get involved. The problem is now we need to be involved. You know, now we get that line of, remember what the Marine said to Rumsfeld? He said, America's not at war. The American military is at war. America's at the mall. Right, right. And, and you know, I'm, and I'm not a historian, not being a historian and speaking a little outside my depth, my understanding of what American culture was in World War II was that, you know, this was really uh, America being pulled into this thing and then having to prove itself in a way and come together as a country. And, and you know, a lot of it being, you know, every Warner Brothers cartoon well, that I ever like, saw that was, that was not right. – that, you know, that they tried to there censor. There was a war effort. There yes, was a war. There was, was a war effort. There was a so, home front. Yes. There was a home front. There was a. There was a. Now. There was a public no. campaign and like oh because it was easy. It was, I think it was an easy thing for the country to go. This thing is the enemy. This is the enemy. Right. Well, let's all focus all of our effort on this and let's let's bail America. Let's let's. Also, I don't see a scenario where Bryce Harper leaves the Major League Baseball to go fight in a war. You know no. what I mean? Well, you know that's the great irony is John Wayne is considered in this country as being sort of the America's tough guy, and the irony is he became a tough guy because all the real tough guy actors left to go join the army. <laughs> so he literally was the only guy left. And as a result, he got all these macho war parts and he never served. You know, guys like Jimmy Stewart, you know, he was a bomber pilot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 you take that, Mr. Hitler. Yeah. I mean, Ted Williams, three years of his career was gone because right. he was flying planes in the Pacific. It's like insane. But now, you know, Hit 522 home runs without thing, those three years. The thing that I find really interesting is that um, people people do need – I mean, as humans, we do need a sense of purpose. And But I feel like – I mean, I don't know. Maybe this is a – maybe this is a, a raw – an incorrect statement. But sadly, I think a lot of people – who in the World War II would have, you know, rallied behind the war effort or gotten or in the civil rights movement, you know, gotten involved in in social causes and and helped bring about equality. A lot of energy that would have been devoted to that, unfortunately, is people getting that riled up at entertainment. Well, I think that and that's the problem is is entertainment is it become an insulated bubble. You know, it, it, entertainment doesn't have to ref, it doesn't have to take a side on the issue. You don't have to be for the war, against the war, but you should at least acknowledge that these things are happening. You know, I just mean people getting so wrapped up in what's going on in television and film. Oh yeah, and and that's where that's where a lot of outrage is being aimed, and not the fact that. <laughs> Innocent people are dying or like you said that this, you know, like th- that we're being parsed out in terms of, you know, the country not you know, being at the wall and not caring about social causes. I mean, like, though, it's it really seems like um, uh, it's a very dangerous path <laughs> when I see how upset, you know, it was like the, the day that uh, the day that the the, uh, the suicide bomber happened in Istanbul and some guy uh, tweeted something at me that he was up. He was upset about some commercial that ran during one of our during at midnight or something. I was like, and I actually I started I started writing this this epic rant that was going to be like 20 <laughs> tweets of me losing my fucking mind like. Innocent people literally died, and you're upset because of this commercial offended you, and said this fucking commercial, you know. And then, uh, and I put, I blocked him, and I pushed the keyboard away, yeah, and I walked away from the computer. But it just, but this idea that entertainment has become the new social cause is super fucked up. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I, what's shocking is that there are more Americans who are putting out death threats on George R. R. Martin than on the head of ISIS at this point. Right. More people want to kill George R.R. R. Martin because his book is late. Right. Literally, who, whom they love. 
They love him so much that he hasn't written his book fast enough because, as we all know, the mark of a great writer is punctuality. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So Say what you want about his story structure. He delivered on time. Yeah, let me tell you, that Jules Verne (laughs) never missed a deadline. So there's more people. Romance novels make deadlines. Right. So more people are pissed off at him than they are about any of these other real state actors in the world. So you you are the product of parents who had such an interesting point of view between the, you know, just the eras that they saw in World War II and the dawn of television oh, yeah. and civil rights and Vietnam War. And on top of that, also both being brilliant performers and writers. I mean, what, you know, what, what did you take away? Like, what, what is, what do you feel like you've inherited from them from this point of view? Well, the, uh, what, you know, I'm very, very lucky that my parents were around because I think I got to see them work really hard and I got to see that there's no substitute for hard work. And also it doesn't matter how big and successful you are. There's going to be peaks and valleys. Also a gorgeous head of hair. I mean, look at that thing. That this I still got. Thank God. And trust me when it goes (laughs) (laughs) and someday it will. You know, suddenly it'll get curly, and I'll be like, "Oh, this is Shatner's old." <laughs> you got to start taking. You got to yeah. start taking the drugs now right. to prevent yep. that from happening in thirty years. Put it on hold. Well, you know, I watch them both work really hard, and I also I, and I watch them. I watch them fail, and I think that's super important. I think that's the one thing that puts me ahead of of uh, so many millennials is. It, it's okay to be arrogant. It's okay to think that the sun shines out your ass. It's what do you do when the world blocks that sun by putting its foot up your ass? Mm-hmm. You know. And I watched my parents at the height of their game. They didn't get jobs they wanted. They didn't get projects done that they wanted. And they just kept going. And I think that resilience is probably the best gift any parent can give a kid. It's like you've just got to keep going. Yeah. Because the only thing that's going to stop you is death. And until death comes, don't stop. Yeah, your dad said one of the most uh, important things to me in terms of comedy and, and t- you know, it's like, you know, how does how does a Jewish man make Hitler jokes? How does – like and because I'm sure that must have offended scores oh, of people at the time. And if there had been social media, uh, you know, at that time, I'm sure it would have been – Outrage and fire so whatever. And, you know, one of the things that he said that's always been that has been so important to me ever since he said it was, you know, the the important thing about comedy is to subvert authority, you know, to subvert any kind of oppressive thing. Right. And maybe that oppressive thing isn't a person, but maybe it's an idea that kind of has its foot on your neck. Well, you know, I would credit comedy with doing more social change than any academics or or firebrand speakers in history. I mean you know, comedians are the ones who help us change. Because the truth is, if someone's, like we said, shaking your finger, their finger in your face and yelling at you, then your your walls go up. And you go, well, then you can go to hell and you walk away. Thanks, Oliver Stone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but if it's Louis C.K. and you laugh and you go, oh, this is fun. And, you know, it, and then you walk away and you go, oh, he was funny, but he actually had a really good point. Mm-hmm. You know, during the height of the civil rights, Dick Gregory said football is the only time in America where a black man can chase a white man and a hundred thousand white people get up and cheer. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I've just learned about the validity of sports as far as social change. Right. You know, I learned more from Richard Pryor or Eddie Murphy or George Carlin than I did in any sort of historiography class because they break it down. Did you hang out with any of these people when you were a kid? I did. I mean, the guy who actually taught me to write was not my dad. It was Alan Alda. Oh, wow. So he taught me the discipline of writing. Because, I mean, there he was at the height of his game on MASH. And I think, no, it was right after MASH. He was directing movies. And he still had the time to read these 14-year-old boys' stories. Uh-huh. And to give me notes. And, like, because he wasn't my dad. He didn't care about my feelings. He was just like, he's like, well, you've written a good first draft, but it's a first draft. He said, anybody can write. A writer rewrites. So, oh, god damn it. That's a really good. Uh. Yeah. And that's and just knowing when you when the edits come back and you got to do it again, you're like, oh, fuck, I'm not even. Right. I've just started. He's like, he's like, you've just started. And he's like, you need to work on your plot. You need to work. And, and he taught me little things. He's like, why do your characters open their mouth? He said, people don't speak unless they want something. So every time you write a piece of dialogue, there's got to be a reason for that dialogue. He was the one who taught me how to research. He said, you, in your World War III story, the Arabs are all celebrating with a beer. Well, 
If they are Muslims, <laughs> Muslims aren't allowed to drink. And I'm 14 here. I'm like, they're not? Oh, my God. But the Zentradi do. All right. I'm going to have to go back and research. So he taught me all the sort of basic tools that I still use today. Wow. And you never – did you ever entertain an idea in comedy, like just or, or or being a performer, or you just always wanted to be a writer? No, I, I think I may be the only kid in history who actually fought his parents to not be an actor. Because <laughs> <laughs> my mom wanted me to be an actor. She said, "You're you're brilliant. I've seen you in school plays, and you should do it." And and I tried. She got me an agent. I did the audition thing, and I'm like, "Mom, it's not about talent. It's about lust. And and I don't have the lust for acting. I don't have the want." Uh, and then later on, I heard Chris Rock saying I wasn't the funniest guy. I was the guy who wanted it the most. And I, it sort of really brought it home working on SNL as a writer and going with Dean Edwards, going to his club gigs and seeing stand-ups at work because it didn't matter whether there was five people in the audience or 50. That red light went on and they did it. Mm -hmm. I once saw Artie Fuqua do his whole act to an empty room. Didn't matter. I saw Dean Edwards once do his act to a Chinese tourist family that did not speak English. <laughs> it didn't matter. You have to do it. And I had to write when I was a kid. I was 12 years old, wrote my first story, never stopped. So I learned about the lust and, and the drive and the addiction. And I just don't have that for acting. And you wrote – I didn't know you wrote on SNL. That was my first job. I don't think I knew that at all. Did you know that? Yeah. I didn't know that. That was my first job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I – I met with – when I was living in the Valley back in the 90s and couldn't get a job, I met with a family friend, George Shapiro. Because mm -hmm. you know, when you're young, you don't know what you're not doing right. You, you don't even know the mistakes you're making. So right. I just said like, can I just have lunch with you and tell you, here's what I'm doing. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. And in the small talk, he said, why are you living in the Valley? And I said, well, it's the only place I can afford. He said, what do you mean you can afford? Your dad's Mel Brooks. You can live anywhere. And I said, yeah, my dad's Mel Brooks. I'm not. Right. I'm not taking money from him. On my salary as a production assistant, this is what I can afford. And he took a beat and he goes, yeah, you write comedy? And I said, I've written a sketch packet for the Martin Short sketch comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, let me look at it. And I sent it to him. And he said, I'm going to pass it on to Lorne Michaels. And he said, y I said to him, you do that. And he did. And then I got a call. Lorne Michaels, I'd like you to come to New York. <laughs> I'd like you to meet with me. And I did, and I met with him. And, and to his credit, you know, Comrade Stalin does not lie. Mm -hmm. Like, he said to me, you know, this is a very frustrating place to work at, and we write 40 sketches a week, maybe three get on the air. And so you will, you will be in, if you take this job, it will be a very difficult, frustrating job. And then offered it to me, and I took it. And I was there for two years until they fired me. And I always say the best two things Lorne Michaels ever did was hire me and fire me because I did not fit in. I, I'm not a collaborative writer. I'm not a, a writer's room guy. I'm not a kibitzer. So I would have fired me. But wow, I had two years to see what I was made of, to see what I could do, what I couldn't do, and to work with some of the greatest comedians the world has ever seen. Well, if that was the 90s, then it has to been, that had to have been Farley. And No, I got the job. I came to work September 2001. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So literally, I was there. I'd been working for two weeks before the show started. Then 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. And it was an amazing time to be there. You know, what's funny? What's not funny? Uh, the sketches we wrote that did not get on the air mm -hmm. because people flipped out. And right. it, was, it was an interesting time to also see where I think SNL dropped the ball and gave Jon Stewart his career on a silver platter because we didn't go political. Right. There was this feeling of like, don't upset people, don't get controversial, just do like celebrity sketches. But you could see America was hungry to discuss the times we were living in. Mm -hmm. And there was this guy who just took over for Kilbourne and he roared into that gap and he gave America exactly what they needed. Wow. So it was a consequential time to be on that show. Wow. Did, was there ever a period where you thought, I'm going to disguise my last name so that I don't, so people yes. don't. I almost changed my name when I got out of college and I got talked out of it by a family friend who's a lawyer and he said, he said, it looks shifty because, you know, my dad was like, you can't change your name. It's your family name. And I'm like, okay, Mel Kaminsky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you said, can't get in. <laughs> Did he have an answer for that? No, he had nothing. <laughs> ah, uh, you're grounded. I'm a grown up. Yeah. Ah, shit. So, uh, no, I just, I kept it and they just said, uh, you know, uh, 
this family friend basically said to me, like, look, this is this is your path. This is this is what you got to deal with. And there's going to be opportunities, but there's also going to be missed opportunities. People are going to assume because of your name that you're you're riding his coattails, even when you're not. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happened when Zombie Survival Guide came out. Everybody thought it was comedy. It was a comedy book. And I'm like, it's not a comedy book. And they're like, well, but you're Mel Brooks's kid and you won an Emmy for SNL. So we're going to put it in the comedy section. And I'm like, they're going to hate it in the comedy <laughs> section. I'm a nerd. My fellow nerds are we're, – we're very insecure, defensive people. At least we were back then. Remember before nerds got girlfriends, before anime? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We were that last generation of like real nerds. And I'm like, nobody knows who I am. They're going to think Mel Brooks's Brad is pissing on everything they love. And sure enough, first reviews were just brutal. And that's when I started doing the zombie lectures to try to convince people like, no, no, no. I'm, I'm with you. I'm one of you. I actually right. think about this. Oh, wow. And at this point, that's no longer an issue. No, no. I mean, at this point, nobody, nobody knows. Uh, and it's weird to see so, – but yeah, it's weird. Every now and then if I do a book signing and I see somebody in the line with gray hair, I know exactly what they're going to say. Right. They're going to be like, I'm a big fan of your father. And I'm like, well, so am I. And yeah. that's fine. <laughs> Next time I see your dad, I'm going to go, your Max Brooks is dead. Oh, yeah. He's, he's had that a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> Which look, I don't – and now the thing is I'm not – like I haven't been competitive with my dad since I was a teenager because I think the only time I was ever competitive with him was – I didn't know who I was. And I knew from the first time I wrote a short story, like, I'm not him, and I want something from this life that's completely different. Like, what I do every day would be prison for my dad. Mm -hmm. To be in a room alone and to have to write. There was a time when my mother actually locked him in the attic because he couldn't write a song. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, you're going up to the attic and I'm going to lock the door. And when you come down, you'll have a theme song to the 12 chairs. And that's it. <laughs> So we are so different animals. No, I, th I think the only, the only time I ever get jealous of my father is, is when it comes to parenting. Because, you know, we're the first – and you'll see this. We're the first genera generation of schmuck dads mm -hmm. who have to – there's no belt. Yep. I mean my dad never even hit me, but I, he could. Right. It was there. It was, it was a nuclear deterrent. Now it's not yeah. even, a, it's not even on the table. Just... Yeah. And, and... I'm going to take away your iPad. Yeah. I'm going to take away the implant in your eyeball because it's a future time. <laughs> no, and, and looking back now, I realize that half – this is where my mom get, gets a medal because half our family trips were spent with my mother trying to figure ways for me not to bother my dad. Mm -hmm. You know, like setting up activities for me so I wouldn't bother him at breakfast. Just a lot of ways of keeping him happy and undisturbed by the child. Right. That is not my life. Right. My life is parenting my kid. And, you know, while I think it's better and I, I love it, there are those moments <laughs> where I think, like, I'd like to just go and play tennis with Merv Griffin on a Sunday. <laughs> That's what he did. <laughs> He's working. Yeah. It's a Sunday. She was like, my mom would say, well, this is your dad's day off. So, you know, he's going to go to, to Julian Griffin's house and, and play tennis. And you can come, but you have to go play on the lawn with the DeLuise kids. Like, you can't play with your dad. Hmm. And that's how we were. And every, th every now and then I'm like, huh, that must have been nice. <laughs> <laughs> I know the DeLuise kids. They're nice kids. They are. David DeLuise. David's and, awesome. Yeah, he's great. David's Sweet guy. He just has that face that just looks like... You just want to like him the second you see him. Like, ah, that's a good guy. There was uh, – I don't know. You probably have never heard the Julian Griffin stories, have you? No. All right. Now, that's a piece of Hollywood where there was – Merv Griffin's ex, Julian, used to have a house up in Mulholland in the late 70s, early 80s. If you were famous at that time, you went there every Sunday to play tennis. So essentially, like, David DeLuise and I would be on the lawn – playing Six Million Dollar Man, and on the court would be the Six Million Dollar Man. <laughs> <laughs> Lee Majors. Yes. So basically, uh, the, the pictures, you go through the family albums, and you're looking, and you're like, oh my god, here's everybody from Cannonball Run. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. So that, that, that was the Even group. Jackie Chan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even Jackie Chan. Well, back then, back then uh, celebrities all hung out together. That's amazing. You know, back then, being a celebrity was all about being private. You know, like you, if you drove through Beverly Hills in the 70s, it was all hedges. Yeah. Right. It was all about sort of like insular, quiet, don't bother me. Yeah. And also uh, because that was just a community. There was no one else those that they could really yeah. – and, and because 
celebrity meant something different back. Like now, kind of everyone's famous, right? And back then, it was very. It's like, oh, these are the these are the famous people, and they're going to live in in this stratum of society, and don't bother them. And, and like, it's not everything's very you know. It's just integrated now. Well, I think also the the celebrity culture in the 60s after my parents' generation dovetailed with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Right. So being a celebrity was – became about the party. Right. So kids who grew up after me, you know, they have tell-all books to tell. I ain't got nothing, you know. I mean I don't I, – like I don't have any stories of my parents partying or anything like that. Your mom did lock your dad in the attic though. She did lock him in the attic. Oh, yeah, no. She locked him in the attic and one time – she got mad at him because he brought back from a buffet a piece of chocolate cake and she said you can't eat that your cholesterol and he got mad and put his hand over it and said you're not touching it and then she put her hand on his and squashed the cake e true hollywood yeah. stories so those are pretty much our true hollywood stories uh, i saw you speak at a comic-con once and you told a great story about um what in kind of like your fascination with audiobooks and like why oh, you wanted yeah. to make uh, world war z the audiobook which is so fantastic, uh, but uh, that your mom kind of got you into the idea of audiobooks. So yeah, no, I mean, my, my mom is the reason I'm not, I'm not a drug addict. I mean, because I grew up with dyslexia. And dyslexia, they, they call it now a learning difference, not a disability. But let me tell you, when you grew up in the late 70s, early 80s, and you couldn't read, and your teachers thought you were being lazy, uh, it sure as shit felt like a disability. Yeah. So my mother put her career on hold. She gave it all up. And she decided to make me her career. So she researched this weird thing called dyslexia. Nobody knew anything about it. Uh, we had no heroes. And so she had to cobble together a learning pattern for me from scratch. She had me tested. And they discovered that I learned better um, listening than reading. So she would go to the Braille Institute and bring all my books that I had to read for English class. And I listened to my reading list every year. And if I wasn't able to listen, then I would have never graduated. It's that simple. Uh, so audiobooks were super important. Plus, when I was younger, my mother would read to me every night. And then if she had to go work, she would finish the book on tape. So I would listen to the rest of the book from her voice. So either way, she read to me. Oh, wow. So I grew up thinking audiobooks are the way to go. And then in addition to schoolwork, she would get me other books on tape. I never read Lord of the Rings. I listened to it. You know, The Hobbit, listened to it. All these great books, listened to it. Uh, and so when it came time to do World War Z, the audiobook, I thought, you know what? Here, it's a book of interviews. It's screaming to be an audiobook. So I said to Random House, you know, please just like give me the chance. I've done some work in cartoons, cartoon voices, so I know some of these people. Let me reach out. And I did. And we, the result was. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it's the greatest audiobook ever made because we got the greatest talent ever. Yeah. And it wasn't just producers picking people. It was me picking people from my past who may not be A-listers, but you know, I got Tron. I got mm -hmm, Captain yeah. Sheridan. <laughs> I got Bruce Boxleitner Bruce reading. I got I got Tasha Yar. <laughs> you know, Denise Crosby. I got Denise Crosby. I got Jurgen Prochnow from Das Boot, one of my favorite movies to be the German. So I got everybody who I thought was awesome. And yeah, I, I, I think it's probably my masterpiece. It's incredible. And there's the extended version. Was, oh, yeah. Well, thank God. Then they yeah. gave me the money to make the rest of them. And then I could reach out to other people. Uh, like, I got Martin Scorsese on a dare. <laughs> <laughs> I snorted. <laughs> uh, I forgot who, who, what the movie was. Was it Shark Tale that he's in? Yes. He's All right. So he's in Shark Tale. My little boy's watching it. And he says, Daddy, who's, who's that boy? So I said, well, that's Martin Scorsese. And my dad goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He falls asleep. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah you, sh you should get him. You should get him in your audio book. And I said, I said, I don't know him. And he goes, he goes well, I do. And, I, and then I went. Yeah, but you can't get him. <laughs> what do you mean I can't get him? I, I know him. I'm like, no, no, you'll call. You'll get his agent or somebody. No, 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 I'm calling him. I'm calling him. I'm going to get him. I, I was in World War II. I can get Martin Scorsese. <laughs> so sure enough, they had to go to his apartment, but we got Martin Scorsese. And getting Simon Pegg, I met because I met Frank Darabont. Mm -hmm. I met Frank Darabont crazily on the beach. 
because I'm walking with my wife and I hear him yelling, Max, Max, and I turn, he's actually yelling at his dog, Max. So I turn and in the distance I see this older guy and this taller, younger, good-looking guy. So I'm thinking, oh, nice gay May-December couple walking on the beach. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, that's Frank Darabont and Thomas Jane. Okay. <laughs> hey, you were still spot on. Yeah. So we meet and we hang out and he's like, oh, come over for dinner. We go over, he's barbecuing and Simon Pegg's there and we're talking and then we all become friends. And I'm like – Simon's great. He's am- and he plays an American on it and you don't – recognize him in fact he he recorded it in london and they sent me the audio which was downloading as i'm doing something else and suddenly i hear this guy talking on my computer i'm like who the oh my god it's simon Pegg. so he was amazing and i got frank to play the the part of the director in world war z so i thought that was a little poetic Mm -hmm. justice so yeah it's i mean the cast just goes on and on show me another audiobook that has Alan Alda and Henry Rollins. Yeah. <laughs> I remember looking at the cast and saying, this is crazy. Yeah. Well, because I also, we, I, I grew up in the age of the, uh, the all-star cast movies, mm-hmm. which they can't do anymore because everybody's too damn expensive. Right. But like those Irwin Allen movies were awesome. Or The Longest Day, A Bridge Too Far. But I, you know what's silly about that? I feel like it's time for those to come back because... I think star power doesn't really mean anything anymore. No. Because people – getting people to leave their house like a person right. is not <laughs> enough to do that anymore to go see them in the theater. Like the, it has to be – you know, there has to be chatter about it. It has yeah. to be at least yeah. good. It has to be compelling in some way. So just – that old lazy thing of like, and eh, what else are they going to do? You right. know, just throw a famous person. People will go see that guy. Like, I feel like for, like, for the most part, those days are over. I mean, I, I, would, I would just ask all the agents of the world, just, just get them in a room and say, listen, we all have to work for scale on this because mm-hmm. we can't afford it. It's too expensive. But Secret Wars. Everybody who's been in them, we all get together, including Toby, to come back as Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Just do Secret Wars. Everybody will be happy. Or do profit sharing, all right? No yeah. salaries. If this thing makes a gazillion dollars, which it will, everybody gets a share. Who doesn't want to see an all-star cast of Secret Wars? Yeah, yeah. agents get in the way of that stuff. Sometimes. Well, that's the problem. Yeah. Law- law- actually, not agents. I should say lawyers get in the oh, way. Oh, agents yeah. got in the way of the audiobook. There was a couple people that I reached out to, and their agents got in the way. And they were just like, no, no, my client's not going to work for this amount of money. You know, they need this. And I was like... It's an audio book. Yeah. One guy wouldn't even let me get near F. Murray Abraham because they said, oh, no, don't even try. He doesn't roll out of bed uh, unless it's a small fortune. So I wrote to him personally and I said, you know, I'm a – Who is he, Kate Moss? Uh, I just said to him like – you the know, board, timely reference. You know, you are – when I was a kid being dyslexic, my mom got me Red Storm Rising and you read all the parts and you showed me an audio book could be an art form. And I can't offer you a small fortune but I can offer you a chance to literally like make a kid's dream come true. And he wrote back. He's like, I'll do it. And he was amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the thing with the actors. If you can reach out to them and say like people love you and they love your performances and they love this work. And I bet so much cool shit dies. Oh, yeah. That never gets. And I guarantee you, though, people like that, those performers want to do things that are meaningful to them. But I think the default, again, is money and materialism. And because it it just seems like. And then ego. Oh, this person's getting paid this. Well, I'm going to get paid this. How about we just say it's all equal? Right. Y'all get 1%. Yeah. Of of whatever Except the, for the ladies, is. you're getting seventy nine percent of right. that. <laughs> There's, I mean, there, how many great comic books did we grow up with that should be all star casts? Well, I mean, you know, Justice League. Oh wait, oh. Uh. and you know what? Look, I, I'm the, the guy who plays Superman now. I love him. He's awesome. But when I first saw Mad Men, and I first saw John, should have been Ham. I was like, yeah. are you kidding me? I it's think, Superman. I think yeah. Ham. I think Ham could have been a Bruce Wayne too. I absolutely. He's got the dark. I think center. Ham. Ham could have been both. I think Batman v Superman could have been Ham on Ham. Ham on Ham. Ham on yes. Ham. Well, the Muslims are going to see it. Right. Neither are the Jews who make yep. it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who who doesn't want to who doesn't want to see? Who didn't go into come comedy? On. Come on. <laughs> Tell me you wouldn't want to see Harrison Ford as Dark Knight Returns, as the old Frank Miller Dark Knight Returns. Wow. Yeah. It should have been Clint Eastwood. Oh, my God. Can you see that? Oh, would have been so good. They wouldn't have even had to affect the gravelly voice. Right. There yeah. it is. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> 
I still I think Danzig Weller. should I have been Wolverine. I like Peter Weller's voice. <laughs> Did you watch <laughs> the anime? I met Peter Weller doing an a, a audition for voiceover, and uh-huh. he told me the secret to his success. What was it? God. I said, how do you do all these great voices? He says, I don't. I do characters. He said, I'm an impressionist by trade. So when they ask me to do a voice... I just think of someone who I am doing a caricature of, and it just flows. You mean Frank wow. Welker? Frank Welker. Yeah. Oh, I thought you said Peter oh, Weller. Oh, no, no, not Peter oh, Weller. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, Frank, yeah. Frank, Frank Welker. I think Frank Welker. Frank, Frank Weller. Yeah. P- Peter Weller, who I believe is like an architecture professor. Is he? Or he's some... a, a PhD in ancient Rome. Oh. Ah. Robocop yeah. is a Romanist. Yeah, he's a lecturer. Yeah. He lectures. He's yeah. a professor. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. At USC, I believe. Katie could uh, verify that. Find out where he teaches, Katie. But Peter Weller, Dead or Alive, for taking this he exam. Did Come on, how many times? The voice of <laughs> Batman, Bruce Wayne, in the animated <laughs> Batman, uh, Dark Knight. Return. Oh, the animated. Yeah, yeah the no, animated. I'm think I'm thinking of Kevin Conroy. Uh, well, Kevin, who I worked, the definitive with. Batman, yes. really. Yeah. Kevin's fucking Batman. Who I worked with. I mean, there I was sitting next to him, and then he's talking, and everything he says is just so cool. And you know, I'll have a quarter pounder with cheese, and, and I'm just like that. Anything you say is cooler than anything I will ever say. <laughs> So what uh, – how have you kind of avoided – because you seem like a guy who, you know, you'll kind of throw your ideas out there and when the, when the studio system comes back and they're kind of shitty about it, you just go, fuck you, I'm done. Like how do you, how do you sort of maintain – how do you maintain that or how have you – or have you been seduced by the system or do you just not allow that to happen? No, no. I think my – I mean I hate to say it, but I think my sort of guru for this was Mike Nesmith of the Monkees. Mm-hmm. Because he, nice. he had a great interview where he talked about everyone's personal Elvis. And he talked about how Elvis started out being this amazing force of nature. And then by the end, he was copying himself, mm-hmm. doing a caricature of himself because he thought that's what people wanted of him. And he said, every artist has to be careful not to fall into your own personal Elvis. And I see that with writers that I love. Where like th- their early works, you see their passion and you see, oh my God, it's what I have to do. And then their later works is like, cha-ching. Or I... I don't want to fall back into obscurity. I'm comfortable. I'm happy. So I'm just going to photocopy what I've already done. And it's hard. It's hard to follow your heart because believe me, World War Z Part Two, the battle for more money, <laughs> the offers are there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, zombies. Oh, no. no. But I think, go. I think with me personally, I've been extraordinarily lucky because you know, I'm able to write books and, and comic books and those have managed to pay the rent. And every so often, you dip a toe into Hollywood. So like all the work I do for Thomas Tull mm-hmm. is, has been amazing because he taps me as his private world builder. And that's, a, that's sort of a behind-the-scenes job, but it's awesome. I mean he'll literally just call me and, and when Tom calls, you have to go. Yeah. You, you, you go, you see him, and he gives you a franchise. And he says, here's our franchise. Here's what we're doing. I need backstory. I need you to just write me some backstory, but rooted in reality, research – uh, if there's an organization, how is it? What's its history? Who formed it? Where's its funding? Where's its oversight? You know, answer me those real world questions because he's like that. He's he's one of those hardcore nerds yep. who needs everything to make sense. I don't know if you knew this, but the Jaeger. Remember in um, yeah Pacific Rim, right? When Idris Elba is bleeding from the nose and he talks about how the first gen Jaegers were built without radiation shielding. Thomas's idea was to base that on the first generation of Soviet nuclear attack subs. Because <laughs> that really happened. The first we launched our first one, the Nautilus, and the Russians freaked out, and they're like, "We need to get a new nuclear boat into the water." And they built it without radiation shielding, mm. and so it was the fastest boat in the water. And we couldn't figure it out for decades. What are they doing to make it so fast? There's no lead, and so as a result, those early crews were all cancer clusters. Now Thomas knew that, and he's like, "I want that kind of real world research to be in the Jaegers." He also came up with the idea that the Jaeger neural interface was already built and sitting on the shelf because when the script was written thomas was like no no no." he's like you can build something physically overnight but the software needs a generation to design you can't just whip that up so he's like what if it's what if it was for a neural interface fighter plane but that was too expensive so they shelved it and therefore we just took it out dusted it off and plugged it into the jaeger and it makes perfect sense so that's why i love working for him and that is does cross over a little bit. Just as we're kind of winding this down now, but it some a couple some just give us a taste of some of the articles that you've been writing. All right, some of the articles. That, well, for example, everyone's talking about uh, automation 
everyone talks about how automation is going to change the jobs of the future. And so I keep reading these articles of these experts with these PhDs talking about how it's going to change the workforce and globalization as we know it. But they never take it to the next level. They'll say things like, robots are going to put millions of people out of work. And then I think, yeah, what are those millions of people going to do? You know, if you have China, which is the world's uh, sweatshop, and they're, you know, Chinese, are, they're trying to mature their economy. They're trying to transition and trying to do a service-based economy. That's going to take half a century. But what if they don't have half a century? What if in 10 years, automation brings all of our manufacturing jobs back to America? And suddenly you have 100 million young Chinese men who can't feed their babies. That's a recipe for violence. That's how wars start. And so because someone had asked me at West Point, you know, as a sci-fi guy, are you worried about the robot war? And I said, yeah, but I'm not worried about a war with the robots. I'm worried about a war because of the robots. Oh, wow, yeah. Uh, someone else wrote a great short story, an army strategist, about the future minefields. Because, you know, we've, we've got these minefields all over the world which have been abandoned in these third world countries. And these farmers can't plow their fields and kids can't go out and play. He wrote a story about what about when drone mines are left to just wander the ocean and they lock onto ships. Uh, what, and I thought that's an amazing article. And I took it further and said, what would happen to the world economy if they 90% of all our trade is seaborne? What would happen if we knew there were abandoned smart drones lurking in the depths? So, that was one of the ones I read. <laughs> that was another article I wrote. And then another one I wrote was about Zika and about sort of psychologically in this country, we've gone from panic to denial. We had the sort of wet pants early Bush years where we freaked out so much because of anthrax, we invaded the wrong country. And we're still paying that price. But I think the biggest problem of the Bush administration was he cried wolf, and now we don't think any of these threats exist. And they can. And so we have degraded our public health, which has also made us open to bioterrorism. You know, good public health, just vaccinating your kids, just funding, you know, the Center for Disease Control, all these just things we used to do has an, an additional benefit. It, it insulates us from some bioterrorist, and they are out there. And the Marine Corps just did a great study about how in the very, very near future, kids will be able to 3D print viruses in their basements. No, oh, why'd you tell me that? And here's one other – well, no, here's one you'll never be able to sleep at oh, night. Oh, goddammit, why? Oh, are you ready for this, kids? Well, a few years ago, Monsanto patented the gene for corn. And, and the hippies and greenies went crazy, you know, GMOs, GMOs, blah, 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 whatever. Nobody got the real danger of it. it was that since the dawn of agriculture, every farmer takes a percentage of his harvest and bunks it away for seed crop for the next year. Well, now because Monsanto has patented those seeds, you cannot do that. That is illegal. So every year now, the farmers of America have to go to Monsanto to buy their seed crops for the coming year. There is no more warehouses of, of seed crops. Well, that means that if a bioterrorist either poisons the Monsanto food supply or even spreads the rumor that that food is poisoned, then we will lose our entire harvest for a year. Why would you tell people that? At no point did anyone thought, think of uh, genetically modified foods as national security. No one ever came in and said, wait, there's, there's a national security part of this that we're not discussing. So these things are just not solvable. No, they are. They're very, you know, the thing is, we used to have a very workable country. We used to have a country where we understood that everything was tied in. The reason you and I drive on freeways is because Eisenhower sold it as a national security issue. I thought it was because Judge Doom wanted to bulldozer <laughs> Toontown. Well, no, he, that was part of buying up the red cars. Oh, gotcha. gotcha. You know, come on. Let's. Okay. The interstates, the interstates were funded because Eisenhower went to Congress and said, listen, if Ivan nukes all of our airfields, we need places to land our planes. So he funded the national highway system as emergency airfields. <laughs> and we got, that's how we got our national highway system. Oh. Everything used to be have a national security element in it. There used to be these sort of nutrition standards, education standards, because people thought like, well, if we ever have to go to war, we need a strong, healthy populace. Uh, and that has all been eroded over time. 
and we can bring it back. That's the thing. We can bring it back. This isn't Brave New World. This is just going back to what we used to. I know, but that's probably not going to happen. Well, but you know what? There was a – there used to be a time when Americans were not afraid of doing hard things. Right. And I attribute that to immigrants. See, I think the reason that we were so awesome in post-World War II was because we were the children of people who had come to this country like 20 years before. Mm-hmm. And anytime some American whined about taxes or whatever, uh, their parents were like, hey, you don't remember. I come here. I used to eat the cats back in the old country. <laughs> you finish your plate. You pay the taxes. You finish your cat. <laughs> you eat it. This is a cat. These is the a cats good. don't grow on the trees. Uh, we take them out of the trees. They don't grow on them, though. So that – I think that the – only strength we have non-specific ethnicity yeah, it could be anything yeah, could i'm not be saying anything. these are these are my people no or at least half of me but i i would just i would attribute that i mean because the truth is look i've lived in la my whole life and i've never seen a lazy mexican uh, i've never of all the panhandlers the army of panhandlers that have come at me since i was like 12 not one has been latino mm-hmm. and when i drive my kid to the to school in the morning, the only Mexicans I see are standing out in front of like Home Depot, ready to haul away dirt. Mm-hmm. To me, those are the only Americans I see that remind me of my grandparents. So I say we can do it again, but we need to work and we need to sacrifice and we need to do all the things that got us here. And it, it, duh, it, it's not some rousing national cry. It's just like, Here's how we got here. I know, but now we're, we live in a culture where people think they uh, they put a hashtag on Twitter and they've done their civic duty for the month. Right. Well, every, everybody thinks they own. Everybody thinks they're entitled to everything. Right. Uh, and so, quite and maybe that's why they want to kick out all the immigrants. Maybe they're afraid that these are the people who shame us and remind us. Uh, what it takes to build civilization. Well, you know, honestly, if we're not going to pull up our bootstraps, then someone should come. Then that's our fault. Y- you know what? I-, I hate to say this, but True Detective season two. Oh, uh, no, 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 okay. no, no. Okay. Okay. We're not going there. Okay. We're not talking about the show. No. We're talking about the tagline for the show. Okay. Which may be, I think, the most important tagline since We the People. All right. We get the world we deserve. Mm-hmm. Because that is the that is democracy. If you set up a government of by and for the people, where we become the bosses and are theoretically responsible for our own country, we get the world we deserve. And if it ain't the world we like, look in the mirror. But how do we manage a company? A company? How do we manage a country with three hundred and fifty million people? We do. We've been doing it for some time. I mean. You have a system where people, if they understand the issues... Well, that's then, the first problem. You're right. And then they vote. But also, first, they discuss the issues. Maybe put a little, like we said, put a little bit of relevancy back in our entertainment. Or at least just be able to... Or at least try to set up things where people can have conversations instead of just social media fights. Right. Yeah. Like meeting in real... Maybe that's what it is. Like More town halls. Meeting in real places with real people... And not debating online where text can be misconstrued or it's easier to just start insulting people yeah. or it's easier to get offended. Like really face-to-face looking at people and having discussions and even being able to say, I may not agree with you, but at least I, I understand where you're coming from and I right. agree with it. But maybe we can figure out how to solve this without – Well, this is, this is the danger is we've been, we've been you know, divorcing ourselves from the issues for so long that now we're at a point where 50% of the country is going to vote for a TV reality star. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll, I'm, I remember when Bush ran for office and he's like, I've never been out of this country. <laughs> and half the country went, yeah. yeah. And you're like, what? We're a superpower. <laughs> if, if, th- if, this, if this was Costa Rica, yay. But this is America. People are watching you. Also, he grew up rich. Fucking travel. Right. In Maine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mr. Texas accent. Yeah. <laughs> but I, th- I think everyone's got to do their part. And that's, and that's all it takes is everyone just does like their part. When my kid asks me, you know, who is Donald Trump? I just explain it to him. And I don't just say, oh, here, play with the iPad. Right. You know, and when colleges who are now for profit, their job is to kiss ass so then they can just bill kids out of money. How about saying, no, 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 you're, you're here to learn. So little millennial, if I challenge you and you say I'm being microaggressive, tough. <laughs> Right. Because guess what? Out in the world is macroaggressive. <laughs> and if I'm not microaggressive right now, then I am not doing my job to prepare you for macroaggression called real life. Right. Yeah. The, unfortunately, the moments of discomfort, for better or for worse, 
are those moments of yeah. growth. Yeah, you just, I mean, I said to my son the other day when he was like, you're mean, and I'm like, Henry, I love you, but my job is not always to make you happy. My job is to teach you how to become a grown-up, and that may be you get angry at me sometimes. I, like I keep having that conversation with the internet. Yeah. I love you. I want you to grow up. This is for your own. But, you know, people do that, and then it's our job to stand behind those people that do, like Jon Stewart. You know, he did it, and Bill Maher does it, and I've actually seen you do it on occasion. No. You I've seen you get mad. I've seen you get mad at your at your ooh, when you did that stand up special with the vest and <laughs> <laughs> That was a serious vest, Max. Those were that, the, that vest you was had some moments. Around. That vest was not fucking around. But we we all we all need to take No, no, no. Someone you know, listen, someone I think someone described me uh, perfectly on Twitter last night. They said I you're somewhere between blandly cool and mildly annoying. I'm like, "All right, well, that's a bad but everybody, everybody should – anybody with a microphone should – you don't have to take risks all the time because then you do turn people off. You become didactic. But like every now and then, like you take a risk. You say something. And if people get mad at you, maybe that's a good thing. I mean I got – I almost lost my West Point job when I was on Bill Maher when I called the NRA a uh, – what was it? A lobbying group for mass murderers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now let me – And they didn't like that. Well, no, because – no, actually it was a technicality because mm-hmm. – the Bill Maher show had said I worked for West Point, which I didn't. Got it. Which then labels me as a federal employee, which right. is a whole other ball, which I'm not. I don't right. even get paid to be at the Modern War Institute. Right. So I'm not at West Point. I'm at the Modern War Institute at West Point. Right. But to them, that's a big deal. And if I had it to do again, I wouldn't have said what I said. I would have not said they're a lobbying group for mass murderers. I would have said a lobbying group for mass murderers. Uh, child killers and now domestic terrorists. <laughs> Got it. That's what I would have. I would have said but that. But not at, from West Point. Not from no. 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 The, and actually, I think if you read my bio on the on the Modern War Institute site, it says like the opinions expressed by Max Brooks are his and his alone. <laughs> Did you change your Twitter handle, Matt? Max not from West Point. I might have to do that. <laughs> but you know, just come out and say it. Because I do think we live – because of PC, everybody's like hungry for some truth. The problem is the only truth sayers now are guys like Trump and Fox News. It's just mean and wrong and inaccurate. What happened to like the real truth sayers? Yeah, I don't I know. Mean, like, I mean like when they canceled Newsroom, I was like, that was an important show. Like we should hold the news' as, you know, feet to the fire. Yeah, but they needed more seasons of Ballers, yo. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what did you find out about Peter Weller? Is Where is he a classicist? Is he a PhD in Where, in Roman uh, history? Um, well, he went to Katie, you've heard of Wikipedia, correct? Yes, University of North Texas, Syracuse, and UCLA. He got a PhD from UCLA. That's awesome. Why wasn't he on Rome? Uh, I don't know. What else? He used to do. He used to host the History Channel Rome shows. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, now that's awesome. I do think we need to make our entertainment a little more intelligent and our education a little more entertaining. Yeah. Because that's, that's the problem. That's, I mean, we'll talk about this later. It's not ready yet, but I've, I'm on the board of a startup company that's going to specialize in educational comic books. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, because my thing is like comics books, comics I have found is the only print medium that people voluntarily read nowadays. Because mm-hmm. I don't mean like the readers. I don't mean the people who are just like love reading. I mean the rest of us where it's like, oh, shiny bleepy or pages. Yeah. And I find that young people voluntarily read comics. So I'm like, why don't we make to- comics about interesting, cool things? And get them in schools. So that's something that we can talk about later. But it's it's in the works. I would love that's that. Rad. Katie, what'd you got? It doesn't say anything about that. That's Wikipedia. All right. Well, he's a contributor fine. to the History Channel and several productions. Credited as Peter Weller, Syracuse University. Ah, uh, Syracuse. He's a graduate student in art history at UCLA, focusing on the Italian Renaissance. So he's he's good looking and smart. <laughs> Fuck that dude. <sighs> Robocop for you. He's got it all. No, I had I had that moment where I was out to dinner uh, with a group of people and someone said, uh, oh, who plays guitar? And Thomas Jane's like, I do. And I'm like, of course you do. Of course you do. <laughs> you play it with your big dick, Thomas Jane. <laughs> and your bare And, and your no shoes. <laughs> and he says to me, uh, he said something like, yeah, you know, that's not really my name. And I'm like, really, Thomas Jane? Because I'm thinking like his real name is like Lenny Silverberg or whatever. <laughs> and he's like... Yeah, my real name is Thomas Elliot. I'm like, oh god damn it! <laughs> I'm like, so your real name's actually cooler than your stage name? Come on. 
Ugh. Um, excellent. Well, I love that you came on the podcast, and I'm sorry it didn't happen sooner, and I want you to come back. And, uh, yeah, man, I just, I adore you. I think you're great. And Thank you. I, I really, I'm glad that we became friends. Even that one time we had lunch at the Brentwood Market. Which was very cool. Yeah. And, and I, I have, you know, because of you, I get out. Like, I never go out. <laughs> I went to your birthday party that time, and I'm like, oh, my God, there's people. There's a world. There's yeah. a world of people out here. Yeah. You, you, Sometimes step outside the murderous drones I know. And, and live in the now and you'll see the humans. Because you, you're about to get married. Yeah. And when you have kids. <laughs> <laughs> Stop taunting me. It, that's going to be fun. You know, it's funny because I, 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 I am excited and terrified, and I, keep, uh, and I keep teasing Lydia about it. Lydia... Lydia loves the movie Jack and Jill for some reason. She loves it. And she goes, you got to watch it. It's actually really funny. And I go, I don't need to watch it. And she goes, you should. And I go, but I don't want to. And, uh, and so it's become like a running joke. And our thing, she was like, no, you don't understand. Al Pacino was great in it. He should have gotten nominated. And I go, I'm pretty sure he shouldn't have. And she goes, but you always say people shouldn't judge things without seeing it. And I go, I know. I'm making an exception to my own rule because I'm an asshole. But uh, so it's become this running joke where she brings up and I go, Jack and Jill are kids. Which one? Which one? <laughs> I'll watch Jack and Jill or we'll have kids. Yep. Uh, I think like, that's a, That's not funny. <laughs> oh, that's a perfect one. Oh, please. Because you're not. Have you lived with her for very long? We, well, no. I mean, I guess we officially moved in together in February, but I had been staying with her for a okay. few months. But you don't really do TV negotiation yet. What do you mean? Where it's like what to watch. you have to watch Orange is the New Black and in return she has to watch Krull. I wish Orange is the New Black is what she wanted to watch. No. The stuff that Lydia likes to – well, first of all, we both love horror, which okay. is great. Oh, oh my god. So there we you, watch wow. every horror everything. We both have the same taste with that. She's not as much a sci-fi person, but she does kind of watch these crappy serialized – like she loves this show called Rain – on the CW, which is basically like a, a soap opera in the in Queen Eliz in the in, in Elizabethan times, but it's basically a soap opera and everyone's attractive and it's the kind of as they were back then. Of course, yeah. it's the kind of it's the kind of soap opera where uh, even the French and the Scottish have English accents. It's like one of those. After uh, so long time, yeah. All like yeah. <laughs> so, which is actually super offensive if you're Scottish. But, uh, you know, it's it, so – but admittedly, she was like, yeah, I let, you know, she loves Pretty Little Liars as a show that she loves. Like, she loves some of those soap opera e type shows, those serialized soap opera. But she also really does love a lot of the same stuff that I love. That's very, very lucky. So we watch a lot of, you know, like there's no – there's not a lot of negotiation really because most of the stuff is like, oh, great. Yeah, I actually want to – or she'll be the one that says – Oh, uh, didn't you want to watch Midnight Special? That just came out. Like that, we we should oh. we should watch that. But see, like, there's no way on heaven and earth that my wife is ever gonna watch Snow Beast with me, <laughs> <laughs> and not the remake, the good old 1977 Bo Swenson, Yvette Mimo Snow Beast. Lydia is so on board all that, and I am so lucky hearing about you know hearing about Guillermo. She was bummed for Guillermo del Toro because she said. Uh, his family made his family made him get rid of all of the all like put all of his his stuff in a separate house like all of his collectibles and everything, and I literally I've had to st- I had to like put a moratorium. I'm like, and I think I told I think I said this sense before. Like Lydia, you have to stop buying horror movie props. There's not going to be enough room for our oh. taxidermy. So <laughs> she, it's like I, we are so it's I am so blessed when it when it comes to that stuff. Well, see that's that's the law I had with my wife is you know obviously I write about weapons. Yeah. I have a lot. <laughs> None of them are in the house. Of course. But let me tell you, if anyone tries to assault Mel Brooks's attic. <laughs> <laughs> but Mel's up there writing a song. Your mom hasn't let him out. Oh, they're, they're ready. They're ready. I'm, Mel Brooks's house is now a fortress of all the weapons that Let's I've Let's make had. this movie. Yeah. <laughs> Guess where we're going. I never thought I would say in the zombie apocalypse, I'm going to Mel Brooks's house. Yeah. yeah. But There's only one is, place to go. That's, that's the only place to go now. Yeah. Well, please tell, uh, I don't know if he would remember, but please tell your dad I said hello. Uh, you were very sweet at that. We were at that party earlier this year, and you... You made a point to have him say hi to me, and that oh, was yeah. really that was really well. No, because you're gen- you, you're a genuine comedy nerd, and and he's one of those guys. And the fact that him and Carl Reiner and Dick Van Dyke are still alive, I mean, and I know what it's like to get geeked out when you meet somebody, and you're just like, I'm literally yesterday. I'm going hiking with my son. I'm driving. 
turn the corner in Brentwood, and there's Tommy Chong walking down the street <laughs> by himself like a person. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God, there's Tommy Chong. Henry, Henry, this is Tommy, Chicha Chong. And he's like, who's Chicha Chong? I'm like, no. no. All right, I have to explain it to you. I can't show you up in smoke yet. But and it's like, oh, right. And all these movies I can't show you. Corsican Brothers. But that, you know. Oh, yeah, I've been hit with shit. That'll go really well in my house. But, but, Chicha Chong sounds like a Pokemon. It does. When you, but when you uh, got to get them all, man. I just didn't do that. I'm sorry. I take hey, it back. Man. Katie, cut that out. Um, but uh, when, you, when you meet people that, that are heroes of yours and you find that they are the same type of riffy comedy nerd. Like we just did uh, this beta test show last night. It's a new material show that we do. You have to do new material at, at Meltdown. And Dana Carvey did it. And there was like 10 minutes where... He called me up on stage, and we were just fucking around and riffing for 10 minutes, and I got so into it that I forgot for a minute what was happening oh. until I stepped back. I was like, oh, my God. And then you realize, like, yeah, they're just riffy nerds. They're just comedy yeah. nerds, too. They're not – you put them on a pedestal, and you realize, like, you are right. – you're in the right tribe, you know? Like, that's what feels nice. Well, the, and you can tell. The real comedians, they love the game no matter what. Right. And, they're just, and, and they're st- the real comedians are students of comedy. You know, they've studied everybody else's, you know, their moods, their attitudes, their materials, and they're just, they have these encyclopedic knowledges of who did what. Right. You know, it was, I mean, even my dad, my dad and Carl would talk about people from their era a generation back. I'd be like, I don't know who these people are. But it was... Who's Smiley Timmy? Yeah, exactly. They'd be like, oh, you remember Shecky Sheckums? And I'd be like, no, dad, I actually don't. Oh, these kids today, they don't know from vaudeville. It was the old vaudeville guys. And you could see that when uh, Downey Jr. did Chaplin. Mm-hmm. You could see, like, boy, did he study that guy. Mm. It's, you know, it's, I'm not going to say it's a lost art, but it's, it's hard to keep that, the funny going, I think, now in cynicism and political correctness. And it's hard. It's hard. You guys, you guys have to love it. Well, I will say that obstacles are good for comedy. Obstacles create good comedy because if you can figure out how to – Right around them, or or just sort of peek through the holes of what's you know kind of ride that line. It's sort of fun. Like if everyone was okay with everything, comedy might not be as is fun. No, no, and it's hard to not like we said not be self destructive because cause... comedy comes from tragedy, right. and comedy comes is a coping mechanism. And ultimately, every comedy, almost every comedy, everything has the seed of something that's offensive to someone in oh, the yeah. world. And what do you say? 50% of stand-ups would probably be serial killers if comedy was banned? <laughs> well, a comic's notebook looks like the diary of a serial oh, killer. Oh, yeah. I mean, how many times do we hear about some comedian who's committed suicide in a horrible way? Right. And then you, you meet the people who really know him, and they're like, oh, yeah, we knew this was coming. Right. Like, these are – some of them are really damaged. Oh, my – Darkness, God. yeah. Oh, there's, there's, there's a lot of darkness in You comedy. read Richard Pryor's biography. I mean, it's – it's just it's it's Dickens. It's so dark what this yeah. poor guy had to go through, and yeah. yet they and yet he made so many of us laugh. He made so many of us happy. Well, you got very lucky that you got a you got comedy people that. <laughs> no, my dad is not self destructive. He drives me crazy, but he is not self destructive. How old is he now? Ninety. He your ju- dad just turned ninety. He just oh, turned ninety. Oh my god. He just and he goes. Mm, uh, I may have another year in me. Mm, may have another year. I'm like, you've been saying that since I was 12. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are you, it's a difficult thing to face, but are you kind of at that point where you're like, well, I mean, you know, it's someday it'll happen. Oh, yeah. But, but he's made me waiting for this day all my life. I remember I was like 16 and he was having dizzy spells because he had an inner ear thing. He's like, you need to take me to the doctor. And in the car, he goes, ah, this is the first, son. The first of many times you'll be driving me to the doctor. <laughs> Just a little, <laughs> little dizziness now, but soon it'll be like, oh, Dad, you can't swallow? Uh, oh, Dad, uh, you're seeing d- blurry? Uh, oh, son, it was a good ride. Was a good... <laughs> you did the exact same thing when you were talking about your hair. Well, oh, no, I feel that way. I'm like, oh, this was a good ride. <laughs> Sooner or later. It's all going to go downhill. It's, it, we, we never win that battle. Well, that's why it's more important than ever to enjoy your burrito, which is how we sign off the Notice Podcast. Max Brooks has been the guest today. Our sponsors have been Botany 500, suits by Botany 500. Look like a million dollars for only ten. Take that, Mr. Hitler. Also, Jonah Ray's comedy specs. I thought you were going to pipe in. And oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you're too busy working on Mystery Science Theater to riff with people because we're not fucking robots? Is that the deal? No, no. Yeah, a little bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
I'm so riffed out. Can yeah. I tell you how excited I was to see how happy people were to see you up there and that you did not get crucified for you know taking part in this sacred ground that people genuinely are happy for you makes me even happier. The most compliments I've ever received on Twitter was the day after that uh, Mr. Science Theater event. So If it makes you feel any better, Jay Leno's first show, my dad was a guest. Oh, I think wow. it might have been his first or second, but it was very news, very untried. And he said something, and my dad went, <laughs> ah, but you know Johnny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Max Brooks, thank you for being here. Awesome. Well, can, where can people do you just at Max? Are, 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 are social? At MaxBrooks.com. Max, MaxBrooks.com. And that's on uh, Avatar Press Conduct or Avatar Cinema Conduct. Purgatorio. Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito.